Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to, my name is Dr. Sue Ann Sistro. I'm the chair of the Department of Rehabilitation Science, and I'm thrilled to see all of you uh, attending here. There's some people way back there, I see. Um, so thank you all for attending. I also like to thank all the uh, folks that are attending via Zoom, which uh, is a large, probably a large cadre of people from Resna. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you and the people on Zoom. I also want to take a moment to thank, as you might imagine, there is a great deal of planning involved in organizing a lecture such as this. So. I'd also like to thank uh, Emily and Karen, if we could give them a little round of applause for all the planning that they've done to do this. But uh, I certainly am not the person to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Steinfeld, so I'm gonna pass the microphone over to Dr. Lenker, who will introduce Dr. Steinfeld and also the executive director of Resna, Andrea Van Hook. Thank you, Dr. Sisto. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Jim Lenker. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Science. I'm an occupational therapist, and I'm also the current president of Resna. And yeah, thank you. And so as, as, as Dr. Sisto mentioned, we have about 160 or so people who are watching online who are Resna members. And I think we've got another batch of people who are uh, local OTs and PTs and, uh, and friends of the Rehab Science Department who are also watching online. So this is quite the nice mixture between a live event, um, which I think we all prefer when possible, and as well as taking advantage of, of distance technology to be able to broadcast to people who otherwise could not, you know, would not be able to be here. So thank you for being here for a conversation with Dr. Steinfeld. Um, tonight, he's speaking both as the 2024 Rehab Science uh, Gresham Lecturer, as well as Resna's 2024 Colin McLaurin Distinguished Lectureship Award. So tonight, we're getting sort of a two-for-one in terms of distinguished lectureships. What that allows us to do is to co-brand co and co-advertise and co-promote an activity that will be happening uh, independently of one another. Otherwise, um, I think both from the Gresham Lecturer's point of view uh, locally, as well as from Resna's. We've, you know, Ed has been on the short list for, for a while, so it's nice to be able to, to do this at this time. Um, before I, I guess I go into uh, a formal introduction of Dr. Steinfeld, I would like to give just some brief background about the, both the Gresham Lecture and the McLaurin Lecture, so there's some context both for the folks locally and for folks who are we're tuning in at a distance. So since 2011, our Glenn Gresham Visiting Professorship uh, has allowed us to bring a nationally recognized authority in an area related to rehab science for a day of meeting with students and providing a keynote lecture. Uh, Glenn Gresham, the lectureship's namesake, was a faculty member of Yale and Ohio State Medical Schools before he came to UB, where he served on the faculty at UB for over 20 years and was the chair of the Rehabilitation Medicine uh, uh, Department. At ECMC, the Erie County Medical Center, Dr. Gresham developed the Centers for Spinal Cord Injury Unit and set up programs for treatment of post-polio syndrome and traumatic brain injury. So he was quite a, quite a, a, a figure locally. This particular lectureship was set up in his memory um, by a couple of friends of his, Drs. Albert and Linda Rekate. Um, Dr. Albert Rekate joined the UB Medical School faculty in 1954 and established the Department of Rehab Medicine and served as Dean of UB's School of Health-Related Professions from 1965 to 1974. And that last bit of information explains a little bit the connection between um, his, his work at UB and the current Rehab Science Department because he, as one of the first deans of the Health-Related Professions School, then, which subsequently uh, became the School of Health, uh, of Public Health and Health Related Professions. So he was kind of the, the dean of the precursor to our cur current School of, of Public Health and Health Professions. Um, and I don't believe anyone is here tonight from either the Gresham or the Recate families. And so looking around, doesn't, I don't think so. In the past, I think we've had, we may have had someone appear here. So for the past, 
number of years. I don't know the exact date, but I think we've been doing the, the with Resna, we've been doing the McLaurin lecture for over 20 years. Where's Andrea? 30 years. For 30 years, we've had the, within Resna, we've had the, the Colin McLaurin Distinguished Lectureship Award to recognize a scholar and leader who's made a substantial and innovative contribution to the field of rehab engineering and assistive technology through research, education, and or practice. Um, Dr. McLaurin was one of North America's first rehab engineers. He developed dozens of technological breakthroughs and prostheses, <clears throat> and throughout the 50s and, uh, and through 1970 established the first rehabilitation engineering centers in Chicago, Toronto, and Virginia. In 1972, he was a founding member of the International Society of, uh, for Prosthetics and Orthotics, and he played an influential role in the formation of Resna, serving as Resna's second president. Um, so when, when Resna named Dr. Steinfeld as the 2024 Colin McLaurin lecturer, it quickly developed into a happy partnership between Resna and our rehab science department. Um, and uh, since I was Resna's, on Resna's board last year and I'm president this year, um, it resulted in what Andrea uh, Van Hook, our executive director, referred to as really a no-brainer to try and combine the two. And so I'm personally grateful to both Andrea on the Resna side and, and Dr. Sisto on the rehab science side for just working so collaboratively and, and, so, and, and so well. I think things have just gone very, very smoothly to our mutual benefit. So we, we, I really do appreciate that. So now to introduce our esteemed lecturer, uh, Ed Steinfeld. So Dr. Steinfeld is, is a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Architecture at the University at Buffalo and the founding director of the Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access. He's internationally known for his research and publications on accessibility and universal design and has written or co-edited or written or edited 10 books, including Universal Design, Creating Inclusive Div Environments, which is the first textbook on the subject. During his long career, he's collaborated extensively with faculty in the Department of Rehab Science at UB and served on Resna's Board of Directors and is currently serving on one of the standards, uh, Resna Standards Committees uh, related to accessibility. And uh, for 20 years, he directed the RERC on universal design and the built environment, the Rehab Engineering Research Center, which is a very prestigious uh, set of centers uh, uh, devoted to the rehab engineering field and with the one in Buffalo uh, in particular being on universal design. Um, and on a personal note, we're coming up on, I, I, Ed, you were, I'm not sure if you remember this, but you were one of the first people I met when I came to interview at Buffalo, mm -hmm. which was December of 1989. So this is 35 years going on since I knew you, or mm -hmm. first met you. And your, your presence here was actually one of the reasons I decided to come because it became evident to me that the then occupational therapy department here was really interested in getting different people at different vantage points, different discipline backgrounds involved. And, and that was really an, an attraction. And I should add that 35 years ago, I was just getting out of the second grade. And, <laughs> and Ed, I think you were a junior in high school. So, that'd be the case. So, um, so for tonight, uh, Dr. Steinfeld will spend about the next 40 minutes talking about uh, uh, the evolution of universal design, after which we'll have a, a question and answer period for, for 20 or 30 minutes. And um, for those of you attending in person who would like continuing education, Please use the QR code to go to a short evaluation and quiz. For those of you who, would, uh, who are attending virtually on Resna Learn, the short evaluation and quiz will be available following the event in your online dashboard. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Ed Steinfeld. Ed. Okay, turn the lights. We gotta turn the lights off here. Anybody know how to turn these off? <laughs> Okay. Is that okay? Is everybody okay with that? <laughs> you see the slides a lot better. Uh, I want uh, thank you very much, Jim. And um, I also want to offer my warm thanks to the Rehab Sciences Department here at UB uh, for choosing me as the Gresham Lecturer and the Resna for choosing me as the McLaurin Lecture. I'm doubly honored and thankful that I only have to give one lecture instead of two. 
I also want to acknowledge and thank the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. The Institute has been the primary sponsor of funding for universal design in the US. And for 25 years, they funded the Idea Center through a National Center of Excellence grant on universal design and um, another one on public transportation. My career has intersected with rehabilitation engineering, rehabilitation science, and disability studies. And this experience has convinced me that there has to be more communication across disciplinary boundaries to advance universal design in the future. And that is one reason why I'm very interested in giving this lecture. Um, they're gonna, there are going to be a lot of images in this presentation because I'm an architect and I think visually. And most of these are taken from our own work, um, mainly for expediency and because I know that work best. Um, and I'll give a brief, brief visual description of all the images to, sa to save time rather than a, a detailed visual description. So the image on the slide is a photograph of a serpentine ramp at the Ontario Gallery of Art designed by Frank Gehry, a Canadian American architect. Um, and I chose it to represent the search for knowledge as a winding road, something we're still involved in, in universal design. We don't have all the answers and there's still a long way to go. The built environment is as much a social construction as it is a physical construction. Building design uh, provides then a record of how ideas have changed over time. And this photo shows a steep wooden ramp added to the grounds of the Everson Museum in Syracuse, New York, sometime in the early 1970s. It is on a side of the building, it was on a side of the building out of sight from the main entry. So this makeshift ramp was acceptable in the 1970s. It was even considered a triumph for disability rights, that there was some access at all, but it is not acceptable today. It stigmatizes disability, it provokes a reaction against the idea of making buildings accessible, and it, especially for architects who design these buildings, and it put the user at risk. The fact that the building was inaccessible represents the low priority put on accessibility at the time. And here is another accessibility retrofit built in the 2010s at Lincoln Center, a performing arts complex in New York, that was originally constructed in the early 1960s. The complex includes a large raised plaza, which originally only could be accessed using these monumental stairways, this large monumental stairway. Many accidents occurred on the stairway due to the unusual proportions and the lack of railings. The photo shows how the renovation added wide ramps on either side of the plaza, covered by glazed canopies to shelter arising, arriving visitors, wide enough to handle the large crowds using the buildings. Each of the canopies is supported by two columns located in the middle of the path and the middle of the ramp length. The renovated stairs have LED display panels embedded in the stair risers. While this is a much better solution than, 19, than the 1970s example I showed earlier, um, for people with visual impairments, it would be a, a very big surprise to encounter the columns in their unusual location. The renovation actually made the unsafe stairway even worse by adding distracting lighting and text where people walk and need to be paying attention to the stair, to the stair itself. This photo shows the stairway at night. Although accessibility has come a long way, architects still have a lot to learn about designing for people, and especially people with disabilities. Accessibility is actually a compensatory strategy. It's implemented as a top-down activity to adjust a world that is designed to exclude the disabled body. Universal design, on the other hand, is a bottoms-up activity that seeks to change the consciousness of designers so that they will take diverse bodies and abilities into account in all their work. This illustration includes a cutaway of a hypothetical workplace in the context of an urban block 
with diverse occupants engaged in many activities. And it illustrates the scope of universal design, which is in effect everything. And it includes not just the physical environment, but how what services are provided and, and um, many other aspects of our life experience. One way of thinking about it is um, as an experiential design concept. So this timeline is a rough approximation of how the concept has evolved. Now developments don't fit neatly into each decade. So another way of thinking about the evolution of universal design is as a phased process of innovation. And the phases basically boil down to a foundational period that occurred around the 1980s, and in a, a period where we were thinking of universal design as enhanced accessibility in the 1990s, building a case for universal design roughly around the aughts, and rethinking and positioning, which occurred during the 2010 decade, and finally reaching the mainstream between in the 2020 decade. And I also like to say that in effect, we're still doing all these things. So even though we've moved on to another level of thinking, we're still dealing with stuff from, from that uh, is more basic. So the 1980s um, were the foundational period. In the 60s and 70s, advocates for accessible design identified the need for improved standards that in, could improve accessibility across the country. During the late 70s, research was completed to establish an evidence base for consensus standards. These became the foundations for the accessibility requirements of the Rehabilitation Act, the ADA guidelines, and the Fair Housing Accessibility Guidelines. Oops. Sorry having trouble with this cursor. Um, so during, dur during, the, uh, during this time also, we started to realize the limitations of regulations and we conceived of a different approach, namely universal design. These photos show human factors research that I directed when I was on the faculty of Syracuse University. Building on research methods used in England and Scandinavia, we developed full-scale models uh, to, in which that were flexible enough so we could conduct fitting trials to find out what the range of usability was for the population of people with different kinds of disabilities. We, we had about 150 uh, participants in this research with all kinds of different disabilities, and at about 56 of them were um, wheelchair users. We also completed the first research on building design for visual impairment. The goal of this research was to provide a reliable evidence base that could overcome the great diversity in state and local accessibility codes at the time and expand the scope of the existing ANSI standard, which was originally developed in 61. The research covered the major issues identified through an extensive literature review and a comparative study of state and federal accessibility standards. The recommendations from the research were used to develop drafts of a new consensus standard that was approved in 1980. And I served as a, not only the director of the research, but also the secretary of the standards committee. Whoop, this is annoying. <laughs> These photos show human factors that, well, I already said that, hold on. So I'm not gonna get into describing, but you see people using mock-ups or simulations of kitchen, uh, kitchen counters, uh, cabinets, and a toilet stall. This slide shows a cover of the 1980 standard and a page from inside. The standard was expanded from seven pages to 70, reflecting a huge increase in the scope of issues covered. And a notable addition was a section on dwelling units. The standard became the basis for the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standard, which was used for the regulations for the Rehabilitation Act and later versions uh, 
used a lot of the content for the ADA accessibility guidelines that were that were pub published in 1991. The Fair Housing Accessibility Guidelines were, were based on the research to a certain extent, but they were watered down significantly through negotiations with the housing industry. Since that time, there have been many revisions of the standard now managed by the International Code Council, an organization of building code officials. The ADA standards were revised only once in 20 years, and the Fair Housing Accessibility Standards have never been revised. This slide shows the covers of the latest versions of the ICC, what's now called the ICC standard, uh, and the ADA standards on the right. So experience with standards demonstrated that compliance was spotty, uh, but it was also clear that regulations don't convey best practices. And here are two examples of that. The one to 12 slope, one to 12 is the maximum slope of a ramp that's allowed by the regulations. But in our research, even way back then, about 50% of the people who used wheelchairs in our sample could not manage a long ramp at that slope. Yet this slope continues to be the standard. And automated doors are not required by the regulations, though they may be shortly, but right now they're not. Yet many people cannot operate manual doors independently, but they could operate automated doors. So what are the solutions? Now, best practices would be to avoid ramps wherever possible, use on-grade entries, have shallower slopes for level changes, and incorporate elevators and lifts everywhere. Uh, for, for doors, we could require automated doors at principal entries and any doors in a building that have high forces for, that are necessary for fire protection. But neither of these solutions are mandated by the standards today. So after 10 years of experience with accessibility standards in the US, some experts realized that standards were not enough to achieve the goal of disability rights. A new way of thinking was needed that could change the way designers thought about designing for people so that they would, they would consider the issues of disability right from the start. Ron Mace and Ruth Hall Lusher, both architects with disabilities, developed the concept of universal design as a new paradigm of good design. And this is considered the, only, the original definition of universal design, what I have on the screen. The design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. Greg Vander Heiden cast this idea in human factors terms. In general, in the human factors, in the ergonomic design field, the idea is to accommodate 90 to 95% of the target population for your product or your environment. Assuming a normal distribution of abilities, this means the fifth through the 95th percentile or the 90th through the fifth 95th, or the, you could, you could do the fifth through the, I mean the zero percentile to the, to the 90th percentile, depending on the kind of, kind of issues you're dealing with. For each ability, people with disabilities follow into the tail of the distribution, the realm of assistive technology and caregiver assistance. So universal design basically expands the domain of ergonomic design to increase independence. This includes making sure that products and buildings can be used with assistive devices because building design can only go so far as far to compensate for lack of function. There'll always be a need for assistive technology. So it's not like universal design gonna, gonna eliminate the work of occupational therapists and other and rehab engineers. Now, moving on to the 1990s, universal design was conceived by most experts in the 1990s as enhanced usability for all compared to specialized design for a protected class. And this is an important break from the past because it normalized disability. It recognized that disability is something that is part of human experience. 
rather than thinking of it as something for only a small group of people. And um, it makes it, it, when you really think about it, it's a, it's a huge conceptual difference. Now, there were several notable events that occurred in this decade. First of all, Neidler, Neidler funded the Center on Universal Design at North Carolina State University, where they developed the principles of universal design. In Europe, a professional association uh, was developed called the European Institute for De Design and Disability, and is now called the Design for All Europe. The Unlimited by Design exhibit was a landmark exhibit because it it focused on designs that were truer uh, universal designs and design concepts. That was developed at the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, which is a division of the Smithsonian. And a massive universal design handbook compiled articles from around the world on universal design. These are the principles of universal design. Equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive use, perceptible information, tolerance for error, which actually means designing in case somebody makes a mistake, like your undo command on, in, your, in your word processing system, low physical effort, and size and space for approach and use. The principles have been used throughout the world to clarify universal design the CUD, the Center for Universal Design, convened a group of experts, including myself, to develop the principles. The authors used human factors knowledge to address the different aspects of universal design. One of my contributions was to insist that there be no more than seven to eight principles. Uh -huh. We want designers to have it in their mind all the time. And research on cognition demonstrated that seven to eight was the optimal number to remember at any one time without having to refer to a text or think about it and uh, think about it uh, before, before, uh, before acting. Now, major, uh, major advances from accessibility standards were the incorporation of attention to perception, cognition, and the quality of the user experience. These are not part of accessibility standards only brief, only to a certain extent address sensory disabilities and, um, and uh, equality of the experience. Your equitable use is the, is, the, um, is the principle that actually addresses quality. The principles clarified what universal might mean in practice and were widely distributed in reference in the literature on design for disability. This was an important step, but the general architectural and design press did not really pay much attention. And I'm sad to say that as an architect, <laughs> that it, it, really ha it really has not caught on. It, never, it didn't catch on very well. In retrospect, the principles were a mix of outcomes and guidelines. Some were difficult to understand or vague, like tolerance for error and equitable use. And the principles were also focused primarily on product design and they were hard to interpret for buildings, for urban design, and for service design. The Unlimited by Design exhibit was curated by Bruce Hanna, an industrial designer, and George Covington, a person with a disability who was a strong, uh, dis uh, strong advocate for disability rights, at the Cooper Hubert Design Museum in New York City in 1998. This exhibit featured the latest products incorporating universal design concepts, plus some visionary conceptual designs. Working with Hannah, the Idea Center curated two more exhibits in Buffalo and Milwaukee with updated products. In the three locations, the exhibit was installed. Thousands of people were exposed to the concept of universal design. The illustrations show a conceptual universal kitchen on the left developed by the Rhode Island School of Design and a visitor trying out an easy to use salad spinner on the right, one of the products in a line, a line developed by the OXO, OXO uh, Good Grips com, uh, company. Those products, some of those products are still on the market. 
The European Institute on Disabil Design for Disability was instrumental in broadening the scope of accessibility. Given the multicultural nature of Europe and the human rights initiatives in the Council of Europe, they understood the broader relevance of access to resources early on and coined the term design for all, which they used instead of universal design, but really was the same idea. The, the, uh, the design for all uh, definitions address diversity in a more general way than the US universal design movement. In the Handbook of Universal Design, edited by Wolfgang Preiser and Elaine Ostroff, Elaine, by the way, was a major mover in, uh, in the field of universal design. She was everywhere all the time, and she was really a, a, an incredible, effective champion of the universal design concept. Um, this captured the state of the science worldwide at the end of the 1990s. But most of the articles really focused on accessibility reflecting confusion about the two concepts. This reflected the fact that universal design was viewed even by its practitioners as a term for enhanced accessibility. Corey Smith from our center was the editor of a second edition that reflected advances a decade later. So I'm gonna pause here and just hammer home a point. Compliance with the ADA standards is not universal design. M many, many people think that the two are the same, but it's very misleading and confusing, and in some ways has retarded the advancement of the universal design concept. That is to say, accessibility isn't a part of universal and far, far that is not the case, but it's a really different concepts as I described. And just think top down, bottom up, and I think you get the idea. So this photo graphically de demonstrates the limitations of regulation. The photo shows a sign in the parking lot of a picnic area mounted on a fence that had a table next to it. The sign says, picnic area for handicap only. Local ordinance prohibits use by others. And this is really not what we want, is it? We want... <laughs> the ordinance is absurd since it should be obvious that people with disabilities will not necessarily come here alone <clears throat> and not only with a group of people, other people with disabilities. So the ordinance, why was this ordinance created? It was probably created because there was only one accessible picnic table the minimum required by regulations. And that table was in the parking lot because it was <laughs> the easiest one to make accessible. And there were other picnic tables in, the, in this park down on the riverbank. But this table was proved to be very popular because people with disabilities uh, so that people with, people with disabilities couldn't use it because when they showed up, somebody was using it. So somebody complained. And then they passed a regulation, a local law. Why were people using it? Anybody got it? Yeah, it was convenient. It's convenient to the parking area, which made it the most, the easiest table to set up for a picnic. And not only that, if you bring kids with you, the parking lot is a good place to ride, you know, big wheels and skateboards and other things. And it, and it obviously was a table that, that had some universal design attributes. Whoops, <laughs> this is very <laughs> hard to maneuver here. If enough picnic benches along the riverbank were accessible and convenient from the start, there would be no need for this ordinance or for the table in the parking lot. Further, people with disabilities would have equal access to the natural beauty of the site and the health benefits that, it, that that promotes, not just to be sitting around in a parking lot. Paradoxically, the example demonstrates that everyone wants more convenience and usability. So 
So moving on to the to the arts, the arts were a decade focused on building a case for universal design, demonstrating that had value above and beyond accessibility regulations. Oh, by the way, I don't want I don't want anybody to get the idea that I don't like accessibility regulations. They're fantastic things, fantastic development in the field of architecture, but basically it's that's not all there is to to thinking about disability in design. So the Idea Center set, started several activities and supported, supported this goal at the time. In 1999, we received our first Center of Excellence grant, and it came with a mandate to update some of the research from the 1970s, specifically the anthropometry of world mobility. We also launched an initiative on single family private housing as part of this center grant. There were other things we did, but these are two key, key developments. And the city of New York started an initiative to adopt universal design in all city buildings. And we were fortunate enough to obtain the contract to produce their guidance, guidance materials. And then finally, there was a lot of international network going on between the, the people involved in the EIDD and people involved in the universal design movement in the United States. Um, and that really started to ramp up in the, in, the, in the year 2000. So a community of practice was evolving. So let me talk about a few of these, talk about these few developments that, that I'm using as examples. Over a 10 year period with funding from Nidler and the US Access Board, we measured the sizes and abilities of 500 wheelchair users. We did this in Buffalo, in Syracuse and in Pittsburgh with the help of um, Pitt's Rehab Science Department. The original research, which I described earlier, um, had a, a limited sample. So at this time, we were really interested in getting a very large sample um, because there was a lot of pushback from the industry. And we wanted to, we knew that we needed to, to improve the regulations because wheelchairs, wheelchair technology and the people who use wheelchairs changed. Had, had changed a lot. Um, by the year 2000, wheelchair, uh, uh, well, let me go back a bit. In, at the time, in the 1970s, when the first, when the, when the first in the 1980s, when, when the first ANSI standard was, developed, was approved, when, I'm not saying the first, but the, the one that, that I worked on was approved, there was only, there was one manufacturer of wheelchairs that made 90% of the wheelchairs. And all of those were the same size. So, so I, I'm probably exaggerating here, but <laughs> that was generally the case. And um, by the year 2000, wheel mobility technology had changed significantly. There were parallel advances in medical practice and rehabilitation and accessibility. And this enabled a much more diverse group of people to be active in the community. So a new round of research was needed. And this time we had more sophisticated tools. Victor Pecat, an expert in human factors research at UB's engineering school, joined us to direct, to help direct this research. So he and I were the co-directors of that project. The photos show how we collected the data on body size and reaching abilities using a digitizing arm. This enabled us to create 3D models of the participants and analyze the data in much more sophisticated ways than the earlier study. Some people might say, well, why didn't you just do body scans? Well, one, one thing we learned, you couldn't do body scans of people in wheelchairs unless you took them out of the wheelchair because the wheelchair got in the way of the scan of their bodies. So we had to have a, a, another way to do it because we didn't want to, to we didn't want to, to be transferring people in and out, which is a, it puts people at risk. Uh, and we also wanted to actually know what the dimensions of people were using in their chair. That was really important. Whoops. So these two photos how, showed how we studied maneuvering abilities using lightweight cardboard tubes that could be adjusted to find the minimal clearances each individual needed. We visualized the data in ways that could help designers and standards developers make decisions. 
These graphics illustrated how many individuals in our sample would be accommodated with different dimensions. So for example, you can look over here and, um, and, and, uh, where is it? and see how far a person could reach from a forward reach or a side reach. And in the cell, it tells you what the percentage of people in the sample was that could reach to that particular cell, each being a four inch by four inch um, uh, square. And only, and what we found, one of the things we found that only 70% of manual wheelchairs users could reach to the maximum height allowable for the placement of anything that had to be operated. So 30% of people were not being accommodated. Mm. And that was even higher for people who use power wheelchairs. And we also, you can see this, this dash line represents where the standard, the standards requirements. And for side reach, we see that almost 100%, 98%, of the users, the manual wheelchair users could reach to that limit. So this work contributed to improvements in standards for buildings, transportation vehicles, and medical and diagnostic equipment and still being used with still a lot of data that we're trying to get uh, adopted by regulations, but at least we have it to use for best practices. And this slide shows how we followed up on this project. And this is some recent research following up. Clive D'Souza, a former graduate student at UB and postdoc is still collaborating with us. He now, he's now on the faculty at Pitt and um, he is developing interactive tools for using the data in design. And this illustration shows one of the tools under development. A web-based interface allows users to select characteristics of people in the sample and different views, and then find out how many people are uh, accommodated uh, by any particular dimension. You can use sliders to adjust the height or the depth of a, of a reach target. So why is this universal design? Remember that the goal of universal design is to get into the heads of the design. Design tools that can be integrated in design practice will help to accomplish that. Uh, from using tools like this, designers will be able to understand the abilities of an individual with a disability and the implications of their decisions in real time as they design. These are also very useful. These tools are very useful in improving design guidelines and for design education. So this is an illustration, a screenshot taken from the from Clive's uh, web-based models, uh, you can. Uh, this is the this is the website URL. Uh, if you go to that website, use the Chrome browser because I found out yesterday that not all browsers are compatible. So Clive's fixing that. Will take a while. <laughs> now moving on to housing. There are no federal regulations for accessibility to privately built single-family homes the vast majority of housing units in the country. The Fair Housing Act only includes requirements for basic access to multifamily housing. It's very important to remember this. And Title II of the ADA and the Architectural Barriers Act only covers single family housing built with public funding, not private funding. So most of the housing built in this country is single family housing, maybe 60 to 70% of all housing. And in, in some places it's even higher. Like I would imagine Buffalo would be a lot higher and New York would be lower. In the late 1990s, a grassroots movement emerged to develop local and state ordinances to mandate basic access to single family homes or what they called visibility based on a concept developed in England. We partnered with Eleanor Smith, the unofficial leader of this movement to provide technical assistance and support for this initiative. The center tracked the progress of the visitability movement and produced information to share with advocates. We also did research on the need, 
the cost and the design approaches to help advocates get ordinances approved. This work later led to the adoption of visitability standards by the NC Standards Committee at our initiative. Two congressmen wrote a bill for national policy on visitability, but the 2008 mortgage crisis and the politics, which took the wrong turn, have prevented this initiative from moving forward. There are some states that have passed laws applying visitability to publicly funded housing, and there are also some municipalities that have laws applying to all single family housing. Uh, so there's still examples of this going on. Uh, we've tried to do this in New York State, but the state law governing building codes prohibits us from doing it. If you wanna know why, I can explain that later. While visitability is a very basic approach to accessibility, from a housing policy perspective, a federal law would enhance social integration and reduce the cost of home adaptation significantly. And we hope that this movement will be restarted in the future. And the slide shows the covers of two publications the center produced on this topic. On the left is Visitability, a booklet that introduces people to the concept. And on the right is a report commissioned by the AARP on the state of visitability that Jordana Maisel and, and um, Eleanor Smith and I wrote. Um, and these publications are still available through our website. The city of New York has, has been committed for a long time to adopting universal design. And in the early aughts, the Idea Center was hired to develop guidebooks that the city could distribute to the architects it hires. And UDNY was edited by Beth Hauke, my colleague right here. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. <laughs> and the late Scott Danford, another colleague. It compiled guidelines from global sources, including many illustrations of best practices from actual buildings. The second version, UDNY2, made the differences between accessibility and UD clearer by presenting guidelines side by side with standards. And Denise Levine, a colleague at the Idea Center, was the editor of that one. Both documents were pr produced with high quality graphics to appeal to the design community. And the city's design and construction division distributed the books to all their consultants. They're still available through the Idea website. And this illustration shows the cover of the first UDNY book. As research and practice in universal design advanced during this time, there were many events that provided opportunities to learn, share information, and discuss issues. Some of these were organized by the by Idea Center, others were organized by the Institute for Human Centered Design, and the uh, in, in Europe, the EIDD. Today, there are periodic conferences on UD and additional organizations in Japan, Korea, Australia, and India, and other countries. Um, and so this, and, and I think most importantly, an informal association of Nordic countries has sponsored several biannual conferences, not only in Scandinavia, but also in places associated with Nordic culture, like Dublin and York. And by extension, it could be in New York too, right? <laughs> They're very liberal. They're trying to like, they have kind of a cultural imperialism going on here. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, Dublin, York, uh, and York were uh, Viking settlements, as were many other settlements in Europe. The slide shows the cover of an ebook edited by my, co by my colleague, Jordana Maisel, who's also here, um, compiling papers from one of our State of the Science events. In the 2010s, the effort, the, the emphasis is on rethinking and positioning. By this decade, our center has become, had become a key thought leader in the universal design movement. And it was time for us to propose some new concepts to advance the field. By this time, we had many significant, we had made significant progress on uh, safety research, stair safety research, and development of products for wayfinding. We also initiated a research program on mobility in the community through partnerships with the, uh, the uh, uh, through a uh, well period. <laughs> and we had partnerships with Toronto Rehab Institute 
and the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Although we had a strong publication record in peer-reviewed journals and research-oriented books, we decided we also had to produce publications to better reach the professional community. So these are the few things I'm gonna talk about that we did during those 10 years. In the first few years of the decade, Jordana Maisel and I developed a new de definition of universal design to improve the clarity of the concept and increase support for adoption. And this definition is a process that improves, oops, figured out something here. A process that improves human performance, health and wellness, and social participation for a diverse population. And we were influenced uh, by several different sources. So we tried to overcome some of the, well, let me get into that a bit more. I have some notes on that. So the definition overcomes the limitations of the principles I described earlier, but it also broadens the constituency for universal design by increasing the scope beyond usability. We were influenced by the work in Europe. The definition puts the focus on process, recognizing that not every project can accomplish all the goals of universal design in the same way, given differences in resources and context. In other words, universal design is not gonna be the same in, uh, in um, Rwanda as it's going to be in Japan or in uh, New York or in Montana for that matter. Um, the definition positions universal design within the broader movement for design for diversity recognizes that an individual's identity is not solely determined by their abilities. If you're familiar with the universe, with the insect intersectionality concept, it, it basically what we universal design was really a, a, an example of intersectional thinking before intersectional the concept was actually uh, more public. And um, the so given the increased awareness and concern about the impact of the built environment on public health by this time. We emphasize that health and wellness have to be a part of the scope. And then finally, social participation is the ultimate goal of all human rights movements. So we made that explicit. This also recognized the importance of aesthetics in constructing a social identity. Because aesthetics are bound up in the concept of stigma. So we also developed a clear set of eight outcomes in the form of the goals of universal design. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over those in a minute. The principles were not clearly tied to an evidence base. So each of the goals we developed is, develop, is based on a body of knowledge, trying to bridge the gap between research and practice. So designers using the goals in practice, the design could refer to a, data, to a clear body of knowledge um, and the researchers could understand from the designers what they had to study, what, would, what were the needs for knowledge generation. The first four goals are about usability. Body fit means accommodating a wide range of body sizes and abilities, and the knowledge behind this goal is the field of anthropology, anthropometry. Comfort, keeping demands within desirable limits. This knowledge base, the knowledge base behind this goal are the fields of biomechanics and thermal comfort. Awareness, ensuring that critical information for use is easily perceived. The knowledge for, behind this comes from the field of perception and understanding, making methods of operation and use intuitive, clear, and unambiguous. The knowledge behind this is from the field of cognition. And the four photos that I showed describing those goals one is an array of hand dryers in a water play exhibit at, at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. Uh, the designers of the exhibit understood that kids come in all different sizes and you could see two kids, one very large and one very small in this uh, using the hand dryers and everybody's gonna get wet. Um, comfort is illustrated by the Aeron ergonomic office chair uh, awareness is, is 
is illustrated by a guide, uh, a tactile guidance system on the floor of a museum in Japan, leading people from the entry to the reception desk and the elevators. And understanding is illustrated by a dynamic display of information on the New York subway. So you, you can tell when your next stop is coming up, where you've been and where you're going after, you know, where, where the train is going after the next stop. So those are four goals related to usability. The fifth, the fifth goal is wellness, contributing to health promotion, avoidance of disease, and protection from hazards. It is supported by the field of public health. And I feel like we, we had, we had a, maybe a, some sort of understanding about the future because when we were thinking of uh, this goal, part of our concern was about spread of disease and then the pandemic came, you know, so uh, many years later. So I think we, uh, we were right on top of that before it happened. Um, and, the, and the photo we used to illustrate that is an example of a very simple solution to uh, promoting wellness in New York City, uh, an initiative to take space territory away from the vehicle and give it to the pedestrian and people who use active transportation like bicycling, skateboarding, running, and other forms of other forms of uh, transportation. Um, and uh, the the next three goals are about social participation. Social integration is treating all groups with dignity and respect, and this knowledge base comes from the humanities and social sciences. And personalization, incorporating opportunities for choice and expression of individual preferences, a goal that's supported by knowledge from the field of psychology, and cultural appropriateness, respecting and reinforcing cultural values and the context of any design project. This goal is supported by knowledge from anthropology and cultural studies. And the illustrations we use are for social integration, a promenade in a neighborhood in Malmo, Sweden, that uh, is along the waterfront, uh, that is designed to really be welcoming for everybody in the neighborhood. Um, and for personalization, we use the smartphone interface that allows you to select the apps you want and put them in the positions you want to personalize a device for your needs and your preferences. And then for cultural appropriateness, we use, whoops. Yeah. We use a, um, an interesting product called the Hippo Water Carrier. And this uh, water carrier is designed for use in refugee settlements where people have to spend a long time uh, standing in line for water, to collect water. So uh, what happens is a family, of, a family might have their kids stand in line or the grandparents stand in line. So the water carrier is designed to carry enough water for a family of four and it can be wheeled like a wheelbarrow along the ground. And it also can be used to purify water. And uh, the alternative is uh, shown in the photograph. The last person in line uh, is holding a container, a very heavy container of water on their head. There's only so much you can carry on your head. <laughs> so you have to stand in. So a family of four usually has to stand in line all day. Somebody from the family, meaning kids miss school and adults miss work, miss the opportunity to work. So, okay, let me just get back to my notes here. So the goals of universal design can be applied to any design discipline. And as you can see from the various examples that I've shown. Now stairs are a major cause of accidents, particularly for young and old. And more people die from stair accidents than building fires, surprisingly. But stairs are also contribute for improved health. So improved, so, so it's because stair climbing is a good, good form of exercise. And this photograph shows what is called the design for active living. Um, it shows how a required exit stairway can be made more visible and pleasant to use. The stairway is located across from the building elevators and a glazed wall provides a view into see other people using 
using the stairway. Hopefully you'll get motivated to use the stairway yourself from mm -hmm. that. And from the inside provides a visual prospect outside so you can see other people. So a stair becomes more of a social event and more interesting uh, rather than being in a windowless uh, uh, stair, stair, um, stair tower. But encouraging increasing, so that's a good universal design idea right there. But encouraging increased use of stairways also leads to exposing people to increased risk of injury. So in, in second cycle of our RERC in 2005, we started research on stair safety through a collaboration with the Toronto Research Institute. And during the next two cycles, this research came to fruition. This shows some of the research that we did. Um, Toronto Rehab uh, developed a, a way of designing a stairway that could be adjusted to vary dimensions, to vary the, the um, projection of the stair tread over the riser, and to vary, and to vary the, and, and to create situations where you could actually expose people to risks of falls, but be safe because they're in a harness. So they're held up with a harness, um, a safe harness, and they're instrumented uh, for video motion analysis and for um, uh, their, their force gauges embedded in the stairs so that, so that we can measure the forces on the stairs and where the forces were, were applied. And on the top right, so you'll see three photos doing of that. And on the top right, at, at the, around this time, the architects were really into glass stairs. They still are, I don't know why, but they, they, they want to make the most transparent stairways possible. So we were concerned that that might be not a, such a good idea. And we, we had Toronto Rehab do some, in, some research on that. Um, the research results confirmed best practices in stairs design lending weight to the need for better enforcement. This is one area of building code enforcement that's very, very poor. And I, I actually do expert witness testimony on stairway falls. And I do it to find out what the issues are and to get evidence for improving standards. And um, it's amazing the kind of accidents that people have. Uh, as you get older, you have a lot of friends that have had stairway accidents. So we've had a number, we even had one friend who died from a stairway accident. Uh, a prominent surgeon in Buffalo whose uh, career was cut short. Um, but we also learned that glass stair treads can be as safe as solid treads if they are not too transparent and not too and not slippery. So that's something architects would be happy to hear. <laughs> And after five years of product development, our work on rate wayfinding reached a commercialization phase. Our partner Touch Graphics, our industry partner, started to receive major <coughs> commissions for installing interactive touch models in educational, office, and cultural facilities. And this photo shows uh, an interactive model of the National Mall developed for the Smithsonian using the latest technology. Uh, when they finish renovating the ca castle building, hopefully you'll be able to use this again. The models provide information on buildings and sites, direction finding information in, in several different modality, modalities, in text, in speech, and even through refreshable braille if necessary. In this installation, a transparent tactile overlay is mounted on top of a touch sensitive display and building models are glued to the overlay. And when you touch different parts of the model, um, you get text feedback on what you're touching uh, and a menu of options allows you to explore the site and get direction finding information. On, and you could even program in uh, information on the characteristics of the buildings, events that are taking place and whatever else is desirable. So these models are engaging and interesting to a broad visitor population, as you can see uh, in the photo with a group of people clustered around exploring the model. For those of you on the West Coast, a different type of model has been installed at the Alcatraz National Park in San Francisco. And uh, we complete usability evaluations on all the installations to improve the next, next cycle of models. 
Mobility in the community is essential for participation in employment, recreation, and healthcare. And during this decade, the Idea Center received another RERC grant to study accessible public transportation. This research focused on universal design of large buses. And the photo shows a research participant using a simulated bus that we built in our laboratory. We simulated only the front part of the bus because there are stairs usually in a, in a low floor bus, there's a section in the back that has stairs. Our research used a diverse sample of participants to study ramp accessibility, seating layout, and entry location. Jim Linker was a big part of this research. And the photo shows one participant in the simulated bus. He is wired up with a video motion analysis system that tracks his movements. Through this work, we discovered several improvements to standard bus designs that can be used to facilitate boarding and disembarking for people who use wheelchairs, those with visual impairments and frail older people. Such improvements will increase convenience for all passengers and reduce the time it takes to load people who use wheelchairs, a major concern of drivers, transit operators, and passengers. The illustration shows three different approaches to bus layouts for a 40 passenger bus. The left plan is the standard bus plan used in the US with a front entry. And we found that the rear boarding is at in, as in the right plan over here um, is much more convenient because there are no wheel wells in the center of the mm -hmm. bus. Mm -hmm. And there's more space to turn around. Uh, a dual entry approach and to maneuver into the into the um, uh, securement state uh, locations. A dual entry approach, as in the center plan, improves circulation for all. Raised entry platforms facilitate even more by eliminating uh, use even more by eliminating the time required to deploy ramps. Mm -hmm. Today, there are advanced payment systems that can eliminate the need for a driver to manage payment and increase the space available for maneuvering in the front entry. The fare payment device actually takes up space that restricts turning into the, in, into the aisle. Now, it may not be appropriate to change every single bus to a rear entry bus since all the bus stops are designed for front entry, which by the way, was a big mistake made in the in the, in the early days of accessible buses because the initial buses were rear entry, but they moved them to the, they moved the entries to the front early on so that the, because of the fare payment systems, this shows you how all things are inter, interrelated. Um, so the driver had to manage the fare payment, give change and all that. So all the bus stops then were designed for front entry. So, now, now we know it's probably better to do it in the rear and the technology allows fair payment for that. But it's a mammoth undertaking to change all the bus stops in the, in the world, in the country. Uh, so this, but, but we are building some extensive improvements to transit systems, including express bus lanes and um, bus rapid transit as it's called. And, in those situations, raised platforms and uh, and um, rear loading or double entry loading would make sense. Now, building on the visibility initiative described earlier, we received a we received a contract to produce produce uh, to produce um, inclusive housing, a pattern book. This book is a resource for the universal design of one to three family housing, which are not covered, as I noted, was not covered by the Fair Housing Act. And this book is designed for architects and builders, it provides many different examples of visitable and lifespan design and housing. It's, it's available through commercial publisher, Norton Publishing. And the book addresses neighborhood planning, block design, lot design, as well as home design. And the photo shows the cover and one interior page. And we also, we also published through a major publisher, Universal Design Toward Inclusive Environments, the first publication of the goals and the new definition. And it is still, as I believe, it's still the first textbook with a multidisciplinary focus on universal design. The photo shows the cover of that. So 
So, so finally, moving on to the 2020s. Our emphasis here in our own work has been reaching the mainstream. And I believe universal design is starting to penetrate the mainstream, given, given all the work we have. <laughs> this is kind of a good indicator. During the early 2020s, the Idea Center focused on bringing universal design to the broader public and to the, and particularly to the design community and, and to the owners of, of buildings. At, at this point, we think the movement has to focus on recruiting and educating a critical mass of early adopters. So we launched a certification program for public buildings and recruited early adopters. We also developed a reference design for shuttle buses, and we've expanded our work on single family homes through consulting on custom home designs and development of stock home plans. Whoops. Our certification program is called Innovative Solutions for Universal Design, or ISUD, and it focuses on generic public buildings at present, but we're planning on expanding it to specific building types like hospitals and educational facilities. The, the RERC Universal Design funding provided the resources to develop the program, which required custom software, but that made it possible also to have low fees for certification. Um, we found that organizations want to hire us as consultants to work directly with their architects. And by the way, we are actually getting more interest from the owners of buildings and from uh, DEI initiatives than we get from the architects. Sure. Um, since we also have extensive knowledge of regulatory compliance, our contracts usually include a design review for accessibility with recommendations for achieving UD certification or simply incorporating universal design features wherever they made sense for the client. Currently, there are 12 early adopters of the certification program completed or in process, and they range in scope from a playground to a major airport terminal. A billion dollar terminal, by the way, <laughs> big project. The system has over 500 voluntary solutions with a few required solutions in each section. It's highly flexible and certification is based on incorporating enough solutions to reach a threshold, uh, which is the inclusion of 60% of the potential solutions that could be adopted for any project. So it's not a, it's not a heavy lift, purposely. Once, if it, it, once it catches on, we would expect to raise the threshold. And the solutions are divided into nine chapters shown on the left side of the image. It starts with design process to ensure that every project includes education of the design team and a means to manage the incorporation of universal design strategies. The next five chapters cover building components and systems like space clearances, circulation, environmental quality, which means acoustics, lighting, uh, thermal comfort, uh, the site, rooms and spaces, furnishings and equipment. And then the last two address services uh, like, for example, food service or um, employment-related services and policies governing the use of the building. On the right is an infographic that's available online, I believe. I think, Jordana, is it available? And uh, it's a poster form that you can all download and print out. Um, and um, that that describes the program and uh, is a nice wall decoration too. Mm. And in and this is an excerpt from the solutions. It shows the layout of a room that allows everyone to have visual access to displays. Now here's an example of a building that's been completed right here in Williamsville. This is Beth Sedek, a synagogue. Uh, the exterior is a simple and plain and reinterprets the traditional wooden synagogues of Poland, all of which were destroyed during the Holocaust. And it interprets it in a modern Indian in idiom. The building had to be constructed within a strict budget of $7 million raised from the sale of an older property. And this ensured that there would be no mortgage. Hmm. 
I'm, I'm bringing this up because there's an affordability aspect to universal design. Mm -hmm. Further funding has enabled renovations to an existing structure on the site, not shown in this picture. Well, uh, you can see the on-grade entry here and an accessible sacred garden that wraps around the building. The sanctuary looks out onto a stand of trees. Between the fence and the building is a garden and the building is surrounded by, the fence marks the barrier between the sacred and profane space of the parking lot. So we're introducing issues uh, that go beyond accessibility, that the kind of thing that architects think about all the time. And, and these are important to think about from, a, from, a, from an accessibility point of view and from a usability point of view. Uh, and it's not just about it's not just about the usability aspects of a building, as I pointed out. The sanctuary looks out onto a stand of trees. Whoops. Oh yeah, yeah. Looks out onto the. Oh. Wait a minute. What's going on here? So here's an interior view, and you can see the tree, the standard trees in the back. The curvilinear forms recall the interiors of traditional Eastern European synagogues using modern technology. And the seating arrangement is flexible for different size events. The traditional raised platform for the reading desk and arc was eliminated. So all the activities take place, the ritual activities take place on one level so everybody can participate. And we have a lot of people with disabilities in our congregation. I'm a member of the congregation. And I was on the building committee. <laughs> so I was involved in choosing the architect and guiding the development of the project. And we have a very active inclusion committee as well. And the seating arrangement is flexible for different sized events. The traditional raised platform, oh, I mentioned that already. So no seat is further than 50 feet from the altar and reader's desk. Which and to provide better views, the perimeter seating was raised, but 75% of the seating is on the main level. In addition to space for wheeled mobility users distributed throughout the seating area, reading desks were provided. You can see a bit of them here and over here uh, to make it easier for people with limitations to sit and prop up their books on the tables. Research has confirmed that natural materials, ample natural light, and views of nature are conducive to mental health and are sustainable as well. Given that the mean age of the membership is well over 70, good lighting, acoustics, and thermal comfort were important priorities. The reading desk is large enough for rituals and can be used from both sides. It's on wheels to allow different relationships with the congregation, and it can be adjusted to provide access for people of short stature and wheelchair users. We actually have a, have a member of a synagogue that, that reads from the, from the Torah scrolls the, the, that are used during, during rituals, who is a person of short stature. She's only about that tall. And so she, she actually benefits from this lowered thing. And we have wheelchair users as well um, who read from the Torah. Electricity is not used during the Sabbath, so this desk was custom designed uh, to make the adjustments manually. And then there's a, a, a community court that fulfills several functions. It's a lobby, a social space, a gift shop, and a library. The furniture is comfortable, easy to re rearrange. Skylights provide natural light. An acoustic ceiling reduces noise. The wall holds a display of memorial tablets mounted from the old, mounted from, that were mounted in the old buildings that the synagogue inherited <laughs> and space is left for future additions. And you can see the holes. So family members have reserved space where they can add more plaques. And um, a virtual display is provided for more in-depth information on each deceased individual. And when we run out of space, that will be the only way to do it. Furniture is by the way, easy to move. It's lightweight and this, the floor is designed so we can move the furniture without difficulty. Whoops, okay. And this shows uh, 
two photos. The photo on the, on the left shows accessible signs in English, Braille, and Hebrew. Uh, there are, there are bra there's Braille, you can barely see it there. And these are all raised letters here. And uh, the restrooms are all larger than minimum size for accessibility. This single use user restroom on the right is equipped with an automatic door, a changing table, and a child's step for use of the sink and a security seat for infants. And one other example, the Motion Junction Playground in Canandaigua is a great de demonstration of how Design for Disability can derive a successful project. The project was led by a family with a child who has a severe disability. Denise Levine, uh, one of our, my colleagues, worked with a local grassroots group to obtain funding to plan the, to, with the group to plan funding to uh, to obtain funding, plan the site, select equipment, and design a pavilion. Equipment was manufactured by Landscape Structures, a company we have worked with in educational activities on universal design, has pioneered in the adopting the universal design concept. And construction involved participation of volunteers from the community. The photo shows, photos show play structures with children using them, one of the oversized restrooms, and a group using the pavilion, which provides shelter from rain and sun. Equipment is provided for different levels of ability and one of the restrooms has an adult changing table. This project is extremely popular. On a hot summer weekday in July, when I visited, I found about 50 children and adults on the site. An interesting anecdote, a woman who ran a daycare program told me it was the only playground she ever brought her kids to where they did not ask to leave early. So that tells you something about its success. And to convey the knowledge we have accumulated about public transit vehicle design, we developed reference designs that we can use to promote universal design in the transit industry. This slide shows the exterior and interior of a small shuttle bus increasingly used in transit operations. The designs have improvements over the standard bus based on our research. Whoops, happened. The center consults with builders and architects on custom home designs, both for spec homes and for families with members who have disabilities. This house in Iowa was designed for a woman with MS and her family. Uh, projects like this high-end contemporary design help to dispel the notions that universal design is only for people with disabilities or that universal design looks ugly. Uh, and it, it, if you equate universal design with accessibility, Accessibility has a bad rap for that reason, because of the, the nature of a lot of equipment, like grab bars, stainless steel grab bars, lifts, and other things. So, um, so it's very important that we do best practice example that we have best practice examples that we can show to high end architects who become then leaders in the field. If they adopt universal design, everybody else will. Uh, these kind of projects will be featured in major trade publications and often win awards for good design. And the center often gets requests for accessible home plans. We completed a survey of house plan websites and discovered that many of those sites have what they call universal home plans. But what they've done is they basically took out the stairs. They just kind of erased them from the photographs <laughs> or the, or the, the the renderings, and then they just call them universal. Um, and we wanted to provide better quality uh, stock plans for builders and for homeowners. So um, we developed plans for four houses of different styles and price points. And the plans are available for free on our website and, be given, can, and be given, can be given to builders or local architects to adapt for their needs. This house model was built, was built constructed it's a model home as a model home and it has it, it was um, designed by Beth Tauke and her husband Jean and it was built by Beth's sister who is a home builder in Chicago and it won awards 
uh, from the National Association of Home Builders, both their local association and their national association. And I think awards some other awards as well, right? That. Um, so that's one of the so the uh, one of the plans for that house is available. Uh, we provide realistic renderings in, to give households a good idea of the design features of each model. Uh, and there's some of the renderings you can see on this slide. And the plans are, uh, and elevations are provided in, in, a man, in a form that builders and architects can just use. They can actually just use them and add dimensions and technical details in order to get approval from building code officials. Okay, so that is uh, my presentation. And I just wanna conclude with uh, thinking about the future. What is the future of universal design? I have a few ideas listed here. We need to increase ad adoption. We need to address the impact of climate change. And I know that uh, Jordana is already doing that. She has a grant now with uh, one of our other faculty who is an expert on resilience and uh, uh, design for resilience. And, but I think there's a lot to be done there. Uh, we need to see adoption by grassroots advocates. We need to engage other disciplines and professions. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this presentation uh, and uh, because I'm reaching a pretty large audience of different professionals here. And we, we need to uh, look at the use of new technologies in um, universal design practice. So I'd like to like maybe, I know Jim has prepared a couple of questions to start discussion off and then maybe we, we can open it up to the rest. Okay, thanks so much, Jim. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes for uh, for questions from our allotted time. And so, Ed, one of the things I wanted to ask, if I may, is it came up a couple of times throughout the presentation, your use of the word inclusive design. And that came up, I think, in the visibility visitability publication, as well as I think the later housing uh, publication. What is your feeling about the use of, and, and in fact, the center's name is Inclusive, inclusive Design and Environmental Access. How do you feel about the use of the term inclusive? And I, I, I like it a lot. Um, how do you feel about that compared to the use of universal design as a term? So we used it, we named the center before there was there was an, an initiative on uni called universal design. And um, I think that that all these things mean the same thing. I think we're all talking about the same thing. When you have an innovation, it, it often is, reinterpreted in different ways in the early stages of, ado of adoption. And in Europe, they use the term design for all. Um, in e inclusive design was first used in England. Uh, and it, and it, was, it was really about affordable housing. <laughs> and, um, and, and then later, disability was at, design for disability was added in. Um, uni universal design caught on with uh, with the disability rights community to a certain to, to a certain extent, uh, and I think that influenced uh, Neidler in using the term in its own work. I, I from from an architect's point of view, um, Beth and I have written a, an article about about this. Is the term universal design has a certain connotation to architects that creates a barrier because. Uh, architects are concerned with the, the idea of universality, the idea that one size fits all. So it connotes that, that you can design a building one size fits all. That was a, that was a concept that modernist architects used. And modernist architecture has turned out to be not so great, the one size fits all concept. So, so that's why we named the center inclusive design because we didn't want to have to overcome that barrier. But I think it's changing. I think universal design uh, as, I, I think it was Greg Vanderheiden who ta talked about this, thinking about it as universal benefits. <laughs> so you have to like explain to people what, that this is, this is universal benefits. It's not one size fits all. 
It's about, so, so for example, the houses, the floor plans, we could select one house and have the, what we might think is the best house, but we want to provide choices. So even, even one house design has several options for different kinds of families. So there is no one best solution. So those are some thoughts about that. Yeah, and I think that idea of universal benefits, I think that actually comes out quite well in the uh, universal design goals, where you bring up the idea of cultural appropriateness, the impact on health, and uh, what was the and social inclusion participation, because those to me definitely connote this idea of of universal you know benefits that we can all relate to, and that we all strive and want for ourselves. And I think I, I really like those three goals in particular, because they, for me, they stimulate my thinking about how to change an environment or how to change the design of a product that can be more culturally, in a culturally appropriate way, taking it out of the specific, well, how can I make this physically less demanding, cognitively less demanding, and so forth, but, but bringing out to these broader goals, how can I make it safer and healthier, as examples. So I, I really think those are some nice aspects of the, of, of the goals that I think were ahead of their time, I think, in terms of the broader societal discussions mm -hmm. on cultural appropriateness, appropriateness yeah. and health and wellness and 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 social participation. And I think I think it was probably around 2008 that Jordan and I started crafting this. And you know, this was before everything that's happened in the last four years, right? And uh, you know, I guess we were just you know thinking ahead. Absolutely. Or receiving some kind of mental transmissions from the future. <laughs> well done, regardless of the, of the transmission medium. So, so with that, we are at a hard stop for our time here. So we'll, we'll conclude for the evening. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for those okay. listening and watching from, from Zoom. And uh, thank you. So. so this is a small token of our appreciation for your your talk today. Thanks very much. We hope that you'll enjoy that and we look forward to dinner tonight with you. Okay. With your family. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you, Hong Jin Joe, for helping with the planning. I really appreciate it. And thank you again for your okay. wonderful inspirational talk. Thank you. Didn't we fulfill the goals of the continuing education we're going? Yeah, but Yes. Awesome.